I think that for me, my why is I want I want the forest to be healthy. I want to reduce wildfire risk. I want to reduce the smoke in our air. And I want to convert that into these state-of-the-art buildings. And we have technology now that allows us to do things that are is really quite amazing. But it also allows us to have these conversations. And when you have mass timber buildings and people look at them, there's a emotional feeling people get when they go in there and see it. It's a living product, right? And people have an association with that. Almost always positive, by the way. People just gravitate towards wood. And it allows us to have the conversations like we just did about what's happening in the forest. So I think that's a really positive thing. Welcome to the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady. And we talk about the sustainable building revolution. Our guest today has a family history of five generations of working with forests and personally brings with them over 20 years of experience working directly on issues related to responsible forest management and the wood products industry. He's also a true believer that both business and the environment can win at the same time. And he's invested in that belief by serving as the past president of the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition, works with the Sustainable Northwest Organization after serving three terms as a board member, and then founding and serving as a CEO of the state-of-the-art mass timber manufacturing facility, Boggan Timbers. As a result of his hard work and the dedication that he's put in, he was recognized as the 2020 AWB Entrepreneur of the Year. Mr. Russ Vaughan, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. No worries. We're excited to have you here just because you've been in the in the industry and in the game a lot longer than most people. I mean, we talked about some of your roots in the forest industry, but can you talk a little bit more about how it's turned you into who you are? You know, you were literally born into the, um, you know, a family. Yeah. Maybe start us off there a little bit. Yeah. It, you know, actually it goes far beyond my time on this planet. Um, I was, uh, my great grandfather was a homesteader in Northeast Washington. Um, he'd come from, I believe he was born in Helena. Um, and, uh, worked with a lot of the homesteaders and at some point learned how to build saw sawmills and help, you know, cut things for houses and barns and fences and that kind of thing as people were settling out in the, in Northeast Washington and, and, uh, parts of North Idaho. And, uh, at some point that, you know, just scratching out a living turned into a business and, um, that, uh, his son-in-law became, uh, who was my grandfather, uh, started Boggan Brothers Lumber in 1952. And uh, he, so it's actually interesting that it goes back to my grandmother's side of the family. Um, but uh, Vaughan is Norwegian, and uh, my great-grandfather was uh, Valdemar Anderson, and he was Swedish. So we have a very Scandinavian set of roots on that side of the family. And so, you know, if you know anything about that part of the world, it's very forested and, and lots of history of natural resources. So when they moved to the, the U.S., they, they brought that with them. And uh, so when Vaughan Brothers Lumber started, uh, they had humble beginnings, you know, cutting railroad ties and cutting mining timbers and things that were going on in the 50s and 60s. And then uh, as the, the West grew and the markets were growing and, and uh, you know, California was a big market at that time, it was growing really rapidly. So they started getting into commodity lumber production. And uh, then in the 70s, they invested in what was a small log mill. Um, it's nothing like what a small log mill is today, but it's, it's definitely focused and there has been in our family focus on utilizing the resource and you do that by being able to cut the smallest logs that are out there and utilizing as much as possible rather than you know running it over or burning it what have you and this, this was before like environmentalism was mainstream it was just good ethical stewardship of the landscape and in the in the late 70s um my my dad took over not too long after uh, my grandfather died and then um, his brother, the, the original Boggan brothers, um, passed away not long after that. So he had these, uh, next generation that got thrust into managing, um, uh, 
sawmill and forest management. And so my dad, Dwayne, took over the family business and uh, and had to, and, and that's a challenge. If any of you have been involved with family business, you've got other members of the family that have different uh, interests and, and values and you have to manage all that. It's not just like a shareholder that you can just go, you know, buy out or, or come to some agreement on. So that that was tough. But for a long time, the market was good in the um, early 80s. A lot of uh, lumber manufacturers grew and there was uh, lots of investment and it was a major industry and in particular out west. And uh, then the environmentalism became mainstream. Um, I think that uh, most of the forest industry kind of ignored those things for a long period of time. And that finally kind of came home to roost. And a lot of people remember it either as the timber wars or the spotted owl. part of our history. And that focused mainly on federal forest lands. There were some other lands that were um, kind of caught up in that whole thing. But the the U.S. Forest Service, essentially um, seeing all of these social pressures and everything else that was going on with environmentalism and then, um, you know, a changing workforce, they, they, they had a hard time just adjusting. So what they did is they essentially just shut down. Right. And so what years was this? This was like, so I think 1988 was the high point of the federal uh, timber supply. I think it was like 12.6 billion board feet a year. And then by, I think it was 1993, it was 1.8 billion. So it was like less than 10% of what it was or or, or right there about. So, and, and, and keep in mind that 10% wasn't 10% like here and there. I mean, it was like throughout. So everything reduced by, you know, 90% or 10 times. So you had whole sawmills that went out of business and our family wasn't immune to that. We lost two out of the three sawmills that we owned at the time. Um, we had a sawmill in each of the northeast three counties, two of which were primarily fed by federal timber supply. So we went from uh, a, a very fast growing um, family business with 495 employees at the height to uh, slowly having to you know come to grips with the fact we didn't have timber for these mills. And so one mill in I own Washington got shut down first. And then um, uh, it was about eight or nine years later, Republic Washington shut down. Uh, Both of those were the largest employer in those communities. So um, we went at that time from 495 employees down to just over 100 employees at Colville. And uh, there was enough private forest land around to keep Colville still going. And uh, so I have a tremendous amount of respect for my father to navigate that, navigate the the family business and um, you know, just a, you know, some history there that trying to navigate that we created a employee stock ownership trust. A lot of people know them as an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan. Um, but that allowed uh, some of the ownership to slide over to employees. And then the company was able to borrow against that equity and then pay off family members. So the thing could keep going because in some some things happen in, in family farms and family businesses where you know, family members just want to extract money from the business. Well, when everything's going well, you can do that. But when things retract like they did and you know, not everybody wants to put money in to keep it going. And so um, that's where things get a little tricky. But anyway, that even though all that was tough, my family navigated through that. My dad also in the late 80s, early 90s, invested in the first single pass saw in North America. Wow. So um, that's a that's a Finnish sawmill design where it's it kind of changes the whole way that we look at sawmilling. Traditionally, you take a log and you start whittling away from the outside and you turn it. and You just keep getting more and more slices of wood off of it. Then it goes downstream and they edge it and and there's a thing called a gang saw that'll cut like big wide pieces into two by fours or two by sixes. And so 
it was all predicated on these really big logs. Well, the logs got smaller and smaller as the forest composition changed. And so my dad saw this uh, in the mid 80s, I think he went to Finland for the first time, was told there was small diameter processing there, wanted to see it. And at that time, it was a thought that we would put that as an addition on our other mills. Like it would be the small log side, if you will. What size is defined as small diameter? Yeah. That's a good question. And there's varying answers. But as far as a hue saw is concerned, it primarily goes down to about a four and a half inch top. And that'll allow you to cut two two by fours. Okay. So, you know, and, and the wide part isn't actually four. It has to finish at three and a half. So there's a, there's a little bit of sweet spot there where you can get two two by fours. You could cut a smaller single two by four, but you can imagine that many little pieces and having your productivity be two instead of one, it's the best way to go. So that's kind of the minimum threshold. Now, if you were doing just like a recovery and you wanted to go down to like four inches flat, you could probably do that. But, you know, when you get to the tops of trees, you get a lot of twist and you get a lot of um, movement in the, the shape of the tree. So four and a half is the smallest. But the, the other thing is the, the largest size that that mill will take is about the size of the steering wheel in a car. It's about 12 inches. Okay. So you're talking about absolutely small logs. And instead of whittling away on the outside, it's really focusing on log centering. So that center of the log and then cutting the pieces out away from the center, maximizing the amount of wood that you're cutting each time, and then repeating that, and then waiting until you get to another size until you go to another board. So, you know, you get to like a, a six inch log, for instance, now you could cut uh, two by six and a two by four on top and bottom, three boards instead of two. And then you put another two by six. So it's, it's cut a stack. And the way that they do that, which is really fascinating, is they have two spindles with circular saws on there. Primarily log breakdowns in the past have all been big band saws. So they, they're spin on a big set of wheels and you run the, the log through there and it slices off the piece. But this was circular saws and their teeth were just, you know, barely overlapping. So it allowed you to rip that piece in, in two. So that one, two saws were making one long cut. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what that allows you to do is you have more power and two spindles so you can operate that at a high speed, push logs through there and, and move quite quickly. So you go from high um, recovery on the, on the log, big log, cutting it perfectly where, where the grain is and all that, and you maximize the recovery of board footage per log to maximizing the efficiency and having recovery as a second tier. So you kind of flop it. So you, the big logs, you want to cut as many as possible, but you have to maintain your recovery. The hue saws allow you to maintain your throughput and your efficiency. And then you try to keep your recovery as high as possible, making sure the right logs are in the right sort. But you're talking about you know, thousands and thousands of logs per shift. You're running upwards of a thousand um, lineal feet per minute. Um, it's a it's a totally different game. So I was and I, I kind of equate that small log vision that my dad and the, and the team there had in the 80s and 90s and focusing on that. And after they added that first one, they just basically went all small logs, bought another machine, and that became the core part of the mill, took out the older um, traditional sawmilling. Uh, what does stuff that do for the... What does that do for the forest management, Russ? How is that different from what they were doing using the old Well, I think that, that, that when... In 1988, when you had the high point of the Forest Service uh, volume out there, the log size uh, minimum was like six inches on certain species and then eight inches on others. Um, now, all of a sudden, you're cutting down to a four and a half inch top. You can now open stands that had been, you know, overgrown post wildfire um, that had, you know, in the past essentially no value. I mean, the Forest Service even did what they called bulldozer thinnings in lodgepole stands that had, you know, at the time perceived no value, but they recognized there was a wildfire risk. So they would just go run like a, a D10 bulldozer out there and just push swaths of trees down to try to break up the, the forest canopy. Now, all of a sudden, those trees have value. 
And so now you can go in and, and thin those trees. And, and the other part about a hue saw, if you put more debarkers on it, you can, um, you can cut wood that went through a wildfire. So wildfire actually chars the wood and then most of the wood is, is still sound, but the tree dies. And so over time, this cracking at the tree starts at the top and kind of splits its way down. So if you get it right away, you just lop the top off. And that's, you know, like you would do a typical logging. You haul a black charred piece of wood in there. As long as it didn't, you know, burn into the wood some way or how, it, it, it's able to take the ring debarker, get all that char off. And the reason you get the char off is because that black char gets into the wood chips. The wood chips is the hidden value in a sawmill because you need that to, to pay for the rest of it. Because you have this round piece and you're making rectangles, there's a whole lot around the outside. Well, those wood chips are a big part of it. That goes into um, pulp, which then goes into packaging and paper products and those kinds of things. So if you have a um, piece of char in there, in the wood chips, as it goes through the pulping process, that will leave big black streaks in the, in the paper and make it very weak. So there are certain things, plastics and others, that you can really, um, you really have to get out of the system. But being able to harvest um, trees after they've been burned is especially valuable to the landowner because now you can you can recover some of the costs that that you have. You can now replant the forest. You can do other other things out there on the landscape. It also that small diameter allows you to go into stands that were otherwise not viable and start thinning forests and. You know, we've got an approach now as part of that time. You mentioned the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition, our collaborative efforts there. We really learned a lot about what the environmental community wanted to see out of forests. And you heard a lot of people say, don't cut a tree. That's really not an interest. That's a position based on some fear. Once you find the information, you realize we have to cut trees to save the forest. And so why, you know, in the past, people always had this preconceived notion that, well, the timber industry only wants to go after the big trees, cut the old growth, do all this stuff. Well, that changed a lot. I mean, uh, you know, our change was one thing, but it was kind of across the board in the industry that technology improved, allowing more and more recovery out of smaller logs because that was what was available and what was going to be coming available in future generations. And, you know, sawmilling and forest management is a multi-generational, multi-decade planning process because trees grow, <coughs> excuse me, trees grow slowly. So, um, you know, it, being able to go out there and say, we're not interested in the big trees. You know, quite honestly, we can't even cut them because we have a small log mill. So that was an area to start common ground with a lot of these environmentalists. And, and they were, they really didn't like the wildfires. They didn't like seeing forests overgrown with, with, uh, wood falling over and, and the forest just kind of falling apart. It's pretty obvious when you see it. it's not healthy. There's no light getting to the forest floor. Well, now we can go out there and leave the biggest and best trees behind. We can do um, management with this idea of creating the historic range of variability of what would have been there naturally. What tree species, what size, what spacing, um, all of those factors. So now you give the forest back to the way it was right before you know man was here and and intervening in that you now have a forest that can naturally withstand wildfire a lot of these tree species have um, evolved over time to have thick bark and have a tree canopy that's way up in the air so when a fire burns the understory it doesn't kill the tree very rarely actually kills the tree I got two quick questions with the, how long do you have to harvest a, um, a, a forest fire that's came in before they're, they're not, you're not able to turn that into something, um, and sell that like a two by four. And then how long does a tree, what's the natural life that it takes until you, I guess you can say can harvest it. So like, you know, you plant one seed and then all of a sudden in your, for your species, your territory, what's that life cycle until you can, um, make it. Um, I guess a viable yeah. product. Well, I'll touch the first one first. We use a a rule of thumb. Each thing, each area is different depending on how much moisture there is, what have you. And this is for the fire, post fire salvage. 
Um, and it also is the same for mountain pine beetle, by the way. So, okay. you yeah, know, it's, it's a very similar trauma for the tree. The, the tree dies, starts splitting from the top down. We say it happens in thirds. So the first year, if you get it, let's say it burns in August and you harvest it that winter, you're essentially going to recover everything in that tree that would have been there other than maybe the chip wood and the top. So you're going to recover 85% plus of what you would have cut it if it were green. Each year after that, a third of the tree will start splitting and degrading. So if you wait, let's say with the Forest Service, they have to do these big NEPA analysis, environmental impact statements, all these things in order to sell something. Um, <clears throat> so if they waited two years, you would only have a third of that tree left. So the bottom third of that tree would be viable. So that is uh, is typically where it doesn't make financial sense to do so. Now, there are some other markets for like, you know, if you peel those logs and their season checks, some of them work really good for log homes. But uh, that's a, a pretty limited market. You can't go too far on that. Um, your other question about how long does it take to, to grow is a great question. I would say the way we manage the forests here, we don't typically replant. We let the natural seed stock replenish itself on the landscape. It's the best seed stock for the landscape. It's been from there. That's It, it, it is predisposed to survive in that landscape versus bringing in you know, seedlings from uh, stock that may or may not have been um, from that particular elevation, slope, aspect, all of those things. So, um, but even then, um, it probably takes, you know, 50 to 60 years to get to like a mature tree. But because we're doing small diameter, um, we do things a little bit different. We do about every 15 year entries where we harvest some small trees that are like overstocked in certain areas. Some of the, the middle aged trees that would be some small logs, some would be going to the, the whole log chipper. And then some of the more mature trees where we probably take a little bit of a larger log and send it to another mill that, that, uh, that cuts, you know, bigger boards and then, or maybe goes to a plywood plant because they need a bigger log for a peeling veneer. And then you take the rest of it on up. <clears throat> so we don't really look at it, let's say like they do in the South, right? The South, they, they really manage their seed stock. They grow trees over about a 25 year to 30 year rotation. They get up to a harvest age. They, they do a pre-commercial thin to make sure that the trees are growing appropriately. And then they come back in there and they take small clear cuts. They clear that, they replant it, and then they cycle those around. So they maintain forest cover over the landscape, but it's always kind of moving. So it's like it's like gaps. And some, some of them um, are managing rather small clear cuts. So they actually look like meadows or openings rather than you know, big clear cuts. And that's southern um, yellow pine, right? Yeah. And that, they're, that, that same kind of management happens on the west coast of, of Washington and Oregon and British Columbia. Um, but when you get the Intermountain West where we are, we have so many different species. Um, each elevation and soil type changes the composition of the trees. So we kind of manage in that sequence where we're managing for the tree species that should be there. Um, there are times where you have, let's say, a mountain pine beetle epidemic or wildfire where you have to take more than you would otherwise, but we leave quite a bit on the landscape, um, some for wildlife. So, you know, like wildlife snags that you know, woodpeckers and birds and squirrels and other things would, would uh, be able to do their dens and nests. Um, and we, we just talk about it differently, I think, than most because we're managing for multiple uses. We're managing for recreation. We're managing for aquatics and water and all of these things. And, and the, the proof is in the pudding that it works. People like it. I mean, I hear environmentalists when we do field tours asking why we stopped at that boundary because that forest over there needs it. Um, you know, and a lot of that is just predicated on the Forest Service creating a artificial boundary, sometimes because of, you know, scientific ideas about um, trying to keep denning habitat. Other times it's just because that's where they picked the line to be. So, so I think that it's, yeah, the, the, the forest... Um, I think it makes sense to think of it in terms of what's best for the forest. And our product 
that we're trying to achieve is healthy for us. The byproduct of that is what goes to the mill and then ultimately comes to our facility to make CLT and glue lamp beams and mass timber buildings. So you talked a lot about um, ideas and concepts that kind of merged from kind of being on opposite sides of the fence. Like you talked about uh, the timber wars and the spotted owl before to now, yeah. it kind of seems like there's a lot more collaboration and you've talked a lot about it. Um, and you, and you continue to advocate for that type of conversation, uh, changing gears a, a little bit and taking a step forward, uh, into kind of the building atmosphere. So we've talked a lot about forest management. How, uh, are you and your team at Vaughan Timbers continuing that conversation and that philosophy into turning, uh, those small diameter trees into what everybody knows now as mass timber? Yeah, that's, that's great. I think that, well, for me, my why is I want, I want the forest to be healthy. I want to reduce wildfire risk. I want to reduce the smoke in our air. And I want to convert that into these state-of-the-art buildings. And we have technology now that allows us to do things that is, is really quite amazing. But it also allows us to have these conversations. And um, when you have mass timber buildings and people look at them, there's a... Uh, an emotional feeling people get when they go in there and see it. It's a, it's a living product, right? And people have an association with that. Almost always positive, by the way. I mean, people just gravitate towards wood. And it allows us to have the conversations like we just did about what's happening in the forest. So I think that's a really positive thing. But going forward in terms of like the technology and the building and where are we headed with this? And then the other parts about it is that there's a lot of drivers out there in our economy right now, like, you know, carbon and your um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and your overall global footprint and all these things that mass timber is a great solution for. Because we're, especially when you take it from what would otherwise burn in a wildfire, because that's kind of the highest and best, like, perfect use, because these forests, unfortunately, have turned into a carbon source rather than the carbon sink that they should be because they burn in a wildfire and then we have to deal with all the negative consequences of that. But the buildings that come out of it are, are incredible. The lumber that we get out of those forests to make the glue lamb and CLT, um, it grows slow because it didn't have the nutrients it needed to grow at its optimal level. So it made the the lumber more dense and the knots um, are, are live knots. And what that means is they didn't grow fast enough to keep the bark in there. So the knots stay in the wood and it, it gives a visual feature rather than, you know, it falling out and creating a void in the product. And so, you know, we're, we're now building um, small, medium and large buildings. Um, some of these are, are university buildings some are industrial buildings, some are um, single family custom homes. And we just do some rather small ADUs and some modular type stuff too. So there's a variety of things that we can produce. And then the, the, the nice thing about it is, you know, we've got this kind of simultaneous technology of mass timber and using CNC to create precision parts like big wooden Legos. At the same time, we have this three dimensional software like Revit, for example, that allows architects and designers to go in and build these structures. And not only how do we put the wood together, but what about the clash detection between the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, data, all the things that have to go into making a structure um, effective and work, uh, that all goes together now. And so mass timber being different, you know, because we'd have solid floors and solid walls, as opposed to maybe uh, framing where we can put things in the wall and, and we've developed some trades and some practices that are a little different now that you've got mass timber. So having a 3D model and being able to come up with a solution and then execute on that is really something. I think the other thing that's really great about what we do is it allows us to go into that model and then build a set of sequences and how to build that building. And We've built proprietary uh, software delivery and an animated system that allows us to show each piece 
and put them in order and how they need to be constructed, which then goes back to us. And now we have to deliver that in a constructible way. So the first piece on the load that shows up on the job site has to be the first piece that goes in the ground um, for that job to be successful. And, you know, we did uh, a project recently where we sent out six loads in six days to a, um, a healthcare building that they were putting up in Newport, Washington. And each day they placed that truck. So in six days, we did six loads. Um, that's a three story building. And they were finishing it, you know, right there after the truck had dropped the part off. So once the truck left and the new truck came back in there, they're just, you know, tidying things up and getting prepared for the next set of loads that come in. So that's a totally different way of building rather than having a bunch of two by fours show up on the job site and, you know, having to do a takeoff and say, oh, okay, well, we're going to need this many board feet to frame this out. And then you get your framing crew and they, they pack it in there and they put it in place. We're talking about a pre-designed set of plans and parts that go in sequentially. So even if a crew hasn't done it before and they start doing it, um, they get to be, you know, almost experts immediately because it's, it is, it's like Lego. So you get, you follow the plan and it goes together. Um, but we also have built a, a great team of people that have expertise and how to deliver that and help over those hurdles. So the other thing is the, the buildings are beautiful. The, the thing about mass timber is that you get a finished surface that's also your structure. So many people look at it and they try to just compare it to framing. And I'm like, it's not the same. If you're able to have a finished ceiling, um, once you put that down and that is your, and that becomes your accent or your feature in your room, that's a tremendous value because a lot of times if you're comparing that to like a steel deck and a concrete pour over the top of that, um, you have to drop everything down. You either have to do a drop ceiling or you have to put everything up there and paint it black. You're trying to hide that stuff because it's not very sightly. With mass timber, you highlight it and you like, you want people's eyes to go up and look at that. So you're actually doing multiple things in one pass. Now you might have to go in there and, and touch it up and stain it because it is a construction site, but it's, it's nothing like having to put in like a, you know, like the material behind me here. That's a, it's an accent wall that you pay in addition to what you did to frame up the structure. And when you start looking at it in that sense and you start building your design around wood and mass timber and, and the, the things that it brings to the table, you've got a really interesting value proposition of a faster building, higher performing building because it has thermal mass that doesn't allow heat to transfer between the walls and the floors. Um, it's, it's a pretty incredible thing and it's got a, you know, a great visual. So I always tell people, you know, if it were, you know, if we were selling cars, it's the difference between, you know, an economy car and a luxury brand. Like we're a luxury brand. The old way of doing things is more of a functionality and like dealing with the negative consequences or, or low performance of that structure. The, the speed is one of the most impressive things to me. I know one of your projects, and if you want to try pulling it up, Brady, on the Vogantimbers.com homepage, the McMillan Lake House. Yep. Maybe if you speak for a second for that, because last time I was talking to you, you mentioned, well, you can even read it. You you guys put that thing up in the, was it before winter or the dead of winter? And so it's a 3,000 square foot single family custom home. Yep. And you close the envelope in five days. That's right. In the middle of January. Yeah. So, and if, if people haven't lived, I mean, I was, you know, born and raised in Montana. So is Brady and, you know, anywhere in the Pacific Northwest or up North winter bites. I mean, you can get negative 30, negative 40. And, and so the faster you can close the envelope, the, the much better it is for, you know, all sorts of different reasons, you know? And so well, who frames in January and in, in right. climate? Nobody, because you can't, because it's unpredictable. But if you've got a five day window, even if it's snowing, I mean, this is not like it's not impossible to do. Um, and you can work around the weather. But 
you know, you get it closed in. We we used uh, vapor shield and and some taping of the seams. So essentially, even though we didn't have the windows and the doors and everything, um, it was weather tight. Right. And that started on a Monday, and you saw the picture of uh, Ann McMillan sitting on her second deck in her house. That was on Saturday. That was you know Monday to Saturday. So it was. Uh, you know, and, the, and we're getting better and better all the time. That was an early build for us. We had a lot of things that we learned on there, but um, it's just, it's not that complicated. We can do things in the uh, the model that allows us to speed things up on the job site. Again, you just have a truck show up. If there's a crane or in many cases, we're using like a um, off-road forklift, um, like a telehandler with a screw right. boom and we just put a, a, a spreader bar up there and we can place all these things that way. And it's, uh, it really makes a job site nice. You know, our, our manufacturing facility currently we're limited to four foot wide uh, CLT panels. And a lot of people see that as a uh, limiting factor, but the building industry has been on a four foot grid forever. Right. Plywood's four feet. Lumber units are four feet. Every job site has a forklift to live, lift this stuff off the truck when it shows up. And so now when we're doing some of these projects, especially residential projects, being able to have that same four foot grid lifted off with the forklift or lift it up like, you know, with the crane gives a lot of flexibility, especially for contractors that haven't dealt with it before. Because if you were to build that same thing, let's say we did 10 foot wide panels. You would need a crane. Now, yeah, you could place it faster, but your crew has to have a whole different skill set. Um, cranes are expensive. Um, you know, they're not, you know, crane operators don't grow on trees. They're not always available. So being able to have that flexibility, and I was just talking to a custom home builder that we work with, and he says, you know, he said, the beauty of it is that if you really need to, you can get a few guys and you can you can manually move these things. Right. Um, but you can't do that with any bigger pieces. Well, that's what, after speaking to Tom Bond, I mean, obviously, you know him well. I, yeah. um, You have a lot of history together. Great guy. And one of your you know, lead sales managers out there. But he built his single family custom home out of your CLT, your glue lamb and everything. And he was, ran I, I had the pleasure to go walk it. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, but he was ranting and raving like, I mean, how many, how many people did he have on site that, I mean, he GC'd the whole thing and it, he doesn't have, you know, the background for that, but it, it just, it makes it easier to build out these projects. You're right. Um, you know, another case in point, we did a project in Brooklyn, New York, a seven story, um, it's like a brownstone infill, right. And it was, uh, they call it timber house and, uh, it was an incredible job. Um, the speed is one thing, but you know, they, put up concrete structures very fast in New York, but they have to pour a ton of people and a ton of resources at it. And it's very fast paced, very loud. Um, the contractor there, uh, Rise Development, they, when I went to visit, they uh, took me to another job site. He said, Russ, there's like 20 guys on this job site. They had to pull the forms down. We can use some of them twice, but we have this big pile of debris and garbage and banging and yelling and all this stuff going on. It's really disruptive and chaotic. He said, this job, they have five guys on it. They, when the, the truck crane shows up and pulls up on the curb, because that's the way they had to do it. And then we bring the truck in and they place it. Then the truck crane goes away and then they're just adjusting things and it's really controlled and it's clean and it's sound. And, you know, the neighborhood, um, you know, mainly when you deal with construction, it's an annoyance if you live there. Yeah. But the neighborhood there was like fascinated. Like people were sitting out on their steps, just watching the whole thing go. And they're like, we can't believe how beautiful that is and how that's going together. That is just fascinating. So in what the, size, real quick, what size was that? Do you remember or about? It's a seven story building. Um, it's, uh, I can't remember the the square footage footprint, but it was a pretty large structure. I think it, uh, I would guess it was probably 8,000 square foot footprint, something like that. Maybe a little smaller than that, but it I mean, was. You went, 
you went from 20 to five people like labor on, yeah. on site. Yeah. Yeah. Something to that magnitude. Right. And, you know, in this day and age where um, finding labor is difficult, um, that's a big savings opportunity. Right. And, uh, and we, we, so there's some areas where we speed up and there's some areas where we just take uh, a lot less resources to make it happen. And I think that there's a there's a wide variety of value there that depending on the job site, the needs of the client, the contractor, it can all um, it, it 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 really differentiates what reason they choose mass timber. Mm -hmm. What uh, you you talked a lot about about learning as you've gone, like different aspects and uh, benefits of mass timber that have kind of changed the way uh, people are building. What have you seen um, in the industry over the course of Vaughan Timber's life uh, that's kind of changed your thinking or kind of altered the way that you guys have, have taken course? Well, I think that I went into this knowing that we were very early on and this would adjust, even though that this has been done in Europe and there was some stuff that happened before we got involved. Um, but I think that, you know, the projects are getting bigger. Contractors are becoming more comfortable with it. Owners and architects are really pushing hard to use more mass timber because they see that. I think the next stage that we're looking at is a real quantification of the carbon benefits of using wood versus alter uh, alternative methods. Um, I also think that the um, carbon footprint push from the you know, Fortune 500 and, and the corporate world um, is going to have people look at buildings differently. And I see a future where uh, data centers, you know, that, that's a big, their big focus on what type of energy they use. And, but they're not really building these things anymore efficiently or environmentally friendly. But if they used mass timber, they certainly could. And if they use mass timber that would otherwise have come from wildfire, there's a carbon footprint calculation there that's really beneficial. If we can get that introduced into a carbon market so that companies like Microsoft, for instance, that have made statements publicly that they're going to decarbonize themselves back to um, day zero. So they want a zero carbon footprint overall. So that means they're going to have to buy a lot of offsets because it's a big company. There's lots of people. There's lots of activity going around and in, in the manufacturing and in the the buildings they use and the transportation. So um, they have a lot of work ahead of them. But if we can quantify mass timber and the carbon footprint of that mass timber and the reduction, now all these data centers, these buildings, what have you, they become advantageous from that goal of reducing your carbon footprint, and your greenhouse gas emissions. Not only that, the building performs a lot better. So it's overall emissions and for the life of the building are going to be a lot lower. Um, and then the other one is, uh, you know, Amazon and, and distribution centers. I mean, that's a good example. I mean, Amazon is building a ton of distribution centers all the time to, to put that um, product in your mailbox. And um, I think there's a big push with these, uh, in particular tech companies, to look at better ways of building. And, um, you know, th these big distribution centers, We've actually designed one in 3D model, and it can easily be done on a 50-foot grid like they build them now um, out of all or portion of it being mass timber. And uh, most recently, we were at uh, uh, Janicky Industries, and they're a, uh, uh, an aerospace contractor. They do all kinds of um, really interesting things and lots of clients, not only in aerospace, but in uh, the maritime industry, so they do a lot of stuff with carbon fiber, glass fiber, and that kind of stuff. And uh, they recently, we built with them a very large production facility, all out of mass timber. It's got 100 foot clear span uh, timber trusses. We built a mass timber crane rail that the two 10 ton cranes sit on and run um, for the distance of the building. Um, so there's just a a lot there. And then one of the things that they're building something in there that um, can't have light exposure and some other things in there. So they can't have a lot of windows. 
So it was really important to the ownership group there to build a beautiful building that people could work inside and that they would enjoy. And so having mass timber gives you that warmth, it gives you that beautiful um, environment to, to do work in. And we've seen, you know, other buildings in the past that were built out of heavy timber, you know, 100 plus years ago. And they're kind of awe-inspiring. And uh, now we see that happening with engineered mass timber with CLT, Wulam, et cetera. And so I think that that's the wave of the future. And that's going to really pull this industry up in terms of overall volume are these large projects that um, I think are a little different. We're already seeing the growth in multifamily and in other commercial buildings and university campuses, all for those same aesthetic reasons. But the price um, is very competitive. And if it's designed right, we always encourage people that want to design with mass timber or want to build something with mass timber, get involved with the manufacturer early. Call us at the outset and let us help you optimize that design. Because if you um, just go out there and you're connecting with an architect and they're collecting information from various websites and they, they're they doing, let's say, a pretty good job of laying these things out and they, they know what the spans look like, they don't always know the size of the grid and how that's going to affect the delivery and constructability. Um, there might be places to value engineer the overall volume of wood down. Um, there might be ways to look at it where you speed the, the construction cycle up and it reduces the overall cost and improves the value of your project. So if you treat mass timber as a uh, material supply, you know, like lumber or like uh, steel or concrete, uh, you'll most likely spend more money because you don't, you're not really getting the benefit of it. But if you look at the 3D model and you work with the manufacturer to make sure that you're getting the right product produced, so you've got an efficient production of wood products and an efficient delivery system, and then finally an efficient construction um, schedule, you can get a lot of benefit from mass timber and you can certainly beat the alternative uh, cost of building um, pretty easily. And then I think we're talking about, you know, carbon credits and the value and the carbon that's stored in the wood. Once that gets recognized, I think that's going to be a game changer too, because if you had a product or a project that was kind of on the edge one way or the other constructability and it's, you know, let's say it's a, within a couple percentage points on cost and maybe the traditional way would be less, but you don't have a beautiful building. Well, now all of a sudden, if there's a carbon market out there on that building and you could sell $800,000 worth of uh, carbon credits back to the market or store that value for whatever purposes you have, all of a sudden that, let's say it was a $200,000 difference in price. Now you've got, you know, a $600,000 benefit. Um, right for using mass timber. So there's a lot of things on the horizon that I believe are going to drive mass timber acceleration um, beyond most people's expectations. I got a question. So let's say you are a developer um, and you're, you're trying to wrestle with uh, mass timber and I mean, speak to, I'm going to paint the picture a little bit, but try and speak to us like, um, or the person listening, like you just, you don't even know what mass timber is. And so you you're fortunate enough to have Vaughan lumber with um with your family. And so that's what produces a let's say two by four, eight foot, or two by four or two by six and wider. And then a lot of that, like you get that sourced, and then you have Vaughan timbers, which you're a mass timber producer, and that's in Colville, Washington. And so how does a two by four, two by six, two by eight, maybe speak to me like I'm 10 years old? How does that get turned into CLT? And then what is CLT compared to like a glue lamb and why would I use a glue lamb versus a CLT? And then from a developer standpoint, it's like, do I have to go all in and use a hundred percent? Is there different hybrid models that maybe I could like experiment with? Yeah. Well, first of all, yes, there are hybrid models and you can use traditional materials with a mix of, of CLT. We've had um, mass timber construction in the past, like post and beam structures if you've ever been to a ski resort, you probably have seen glue lamb beams and you know, tongue and groove decking 
boards that are up in the ceiling. So you see this this massive wood structure. Um, and that's just because it's able to withstand the heavy snow loads that are up there at ski resorts. But um, getting back to like, what is CLT? Well, traditionally we take like a two by six. It needs to be dried a little differently than standard because we're gonna be gluing it together and we don't want it to, sh to shrink too much. So we dry it down to a minimum of 15%. We're actually trying to get down around uh, 10 to 12% moisture content to get more stability. So we, uh, we then take lumber of varying lengths. Um, lumber comes in two foot increments, typically from eight to 20 feet. Um, we buy lumber of the kind of uh, grade that we're looking for on the final product. So if it's an industrial grade, it might have a little wane, it might have more knots. Um, there might be some things that are, aren't as great to look at. It's kind of like the leftover boards you see when you go to the home store. You know, there's some boards with some things that aren't sightly and, you know, somebody tosses them aside. So th those, that would be like the lowest grade that we would go for. But the beyond that, we go up and grade from there. So there's architectural grade. Then we create what we call a premium grade, which is just a, a really rock solid piece of wood that is clean and clear. We then finger joint these shorter pieces together because we can make up to a 60 foot long piece, whether it's a glue lamb or CLT. And then, so now we can make that length. So let's say if we're doing a 60 foot piece, we got 10 foot lumber, we glue six of these things together. We've got our 60 foot piece. It then cures and now it acts as one 60 foot long piece. Then that goes over to a molder. We take it from an inch and a half down to an inch and three eighths or 1.375 inches. The reason we do that is we want a nice clean surface for the glue to adhere to. Kind of like if you were staining your deck, you would need to sand it so the, the stain can penetrate and actually go into the wood fibers. So we need that same thing to happen with the wood. But it also allows us to take that rounded ease edge that you see on the lumber. Um, it, it takes that and squares that off because we don't want to have little bumps along the top of our product. So then from there, now we've got it, we've got it molded down. It's square edge. It's the right size. We take the long pieces and we put them together and we lift them up on a belt four feet wide. And then it runs back through a glue head where we have a melamine glue and a hardener that goes in. It starts interacting with one another. We slide that back on this set of conveyors and then it stops. And then a vacuum lift brings up the, the cross lamellas. So this is where CLT comes in. We take a perpendicular piece and we turn it the other way. So now you've got strength this way and strength this way. So it also keeps the stability um, much better than glue lamb would because if you have all the grains going the same way and each piece shrinks just a little bit, you have the same shrinkage overall. With CLT, you have counteracting forces. So that's one of the things that CLT does. So you put the cross lamellas on top, you run it back through that same glue head, you lift another set of four foot um, lumber. So it's four feet wide. So it would be nine pieces of two by six that we slide on top of that uh, set of cross lamellas, kind of makes a sandwich. We kind of tidy that up and push it together a little bit. We enter it into the press, and then that's where the pressure comes in from the side, the top and bottom. And we squeeze that down until it's really tight. And uh, we are, uh, we're getting uh, that bond line. We're trying to get that heated up through a high-frequency system. So we use a, a high-frequency generator. We amplify it with power. It goes into the press, which is completely clad in aluminum. It's clad in aluminum because that high frequency wave goes in there, hits that aluminum, and it dissipates. So no, no uh, high frequency waves are escaping the machine. Um, but what it does is it finds that conductive layer of the glue and starts those micro vibrations in there, heating that glue la layer up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where you're getting that thermal modification and that really fast curing. So we're curing at about uh, roughly a minute per layer. Um, the unique thing about our press also is we press 20 feet at a time in length. So now all of a sudden that six foot or 60 foot piece, we can press that three times and we get all 60 feet pressed. 
and we do that um, in pretty short order. Then it will go down and then would go get cut into with the CNC into the parts that it needs to be finished. Um, I think that the, uh, the really key factor there is all of that pressure and those high frequency waves at the same time. The glue is cl clear, the glue is clear, excuse me. So when you get that product out the other side and you cut it, it just looks like solid wood and it has a really beautiful aesthetic to it because all the grains are going the same way. Um, and so now you have this big panel that can be cut into parts and put together. Glue lamb, on the other hand, is um, layers that are stacked in the same way together with glue in between each one of them. And that can be used as a column. It can be used as a beam. And we can even use it as a panel. And because it's on edge, many times we can use a thinner, what we call GLT, instead of uh, using CLT because it's the flat wise bending, it's just a little bit, a uh, little bit less strength for the amount of fiber. Because if we, if you've ever handled a two by six, let's say a 20 footer, you go flat and it's very flexible, right? And it will <laughs> bend. If you go on edge, it becomes more rigid. And that's just because of the way the fibers interact. So we, uh, we can do that any number of ways, but all of those pieces go into building these buildings. So a lot of times we use the post and beam construction, which is a glue lamb column with a glue lamb beam over the top. We tie that structure together and then we bring the CLT in and we start setting those panels on top. And then we can do the same thing and do that on multiple stories. And you know, now with the codes, we can go up to 18 stories um, with mass timber, which is a pretty, you know, a big deal. That helped a lot. I, I know I got to say, uh, me and Brady are very excited and we can't thank you enough because, you know, Tom Bond and, and you, you guys rolled out the red carpet for me and Brady's project in Missoula, Montana. So we're looking forward to put up, um, you know, our, I guess you could call it our tiny home mass timber ADU, yeah. our auxiliary dwelling units. And yep. so that's coming around the corner and I'm excited to use your CLT project or your product, um, you know, exciting times out there. So but that helped paint a really good picture. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and so changing gears as we kind of come to the end of our time, uh, we want to talk a little bit about who Russ is. Um, a lot of people listening might be young or new to the mass uh, timber industry. And we want to talk about uh, some of your experiences that have helped grow you into the professional that you are and the successful company that Vaughn Timbers is. Um, so we want to ask a couple questions along those lines. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. All right. Perfect. Um, so what philosophy or outlook, uh, you know, kind of based on that experience, would you share with people that are in that position? Well, we, when we started out, we created some core values, fairness, integrity, and transparency. Um, those sound really good. They're not always easy to maintain. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's hard to get all the same people in an organization, um, going the same direction. So, uh, I think it's important to have some sort of North star like that to say, Hey, are we really being fair? Are we really being transparent? Are we operating with integrity? Um, and those are the things I've learned at my time when I was uh, vice president of Vaughan brothers before starting Vaughan timbers, you know, there's no substitute for showing up and there's no substitute for hard work. Um, I think that in this day and age, everybody wants, you know, quick results. Um, but, there's really no such thing. I mean, the, the whole idea of a 10 year overnight success is a good way to look at it in life. You know, it's, people look like they just came out of nowhere when they get on the, you know, whatever big stage that they hit, but that's never by accident. You know, the, it's just like in sports, ultimately your record is what your record is. Like you could have a lot of almosts and not quites, but at the end of the day, the, the world's keeping score. And in business, um, you know, a lot of times we score that by having, you know, profit and loss. But I also mm -hmm. think, you know, that anymore, people are really looking at how you operate and what you do. And, you know, they want to know by, you know, spending their money um, on things that they're spending it in a responsible way and in a way that meets what they're doing. So we want to align with people that value 
the very similar things that that we do. And then also just being very client centered and focused on on trying to deliver value to the client. And and again, uh, you know, sometimes uh, people want things that aren't aren't reasonable, but we try our very best to be very agreeable and to try to get to that common ground. And most of the time we do, and we, we've developed a really good following. Um, we've got people now, because of that philosophy, I believe, that are repeat business. And you know they, they know that we're a new business. And some, we had the good fortune of people um, kind of waiting in line to do business with us when we started because they you know knew my history and they knew what we were trying to do and they wanted to be part of it. Even knowing that the first generation of anything is usually going to be improved, you know, quite quickly. But I think that enough people knew um, in their heart of hearts that this industry needed to move forward, and that they wanted to be part of the beginning of making that change. Um, I think that, and that, I've just been incredibly grateful um, to have people see that and that that resonate with others, and then. I think the other thing from a success standpoint is just surrounding yourself with people that do the things that that we need to do to be successful. You guys talked a lot about, you know, Tom Bond, um, Spencer Bishop, or, or sales director, like Chris Zier, or operations guy. Like these people are extensions of who I am, and then collectively it becomes what Vaughan Timbers is. And, you know, hopefully this is an organization that is bigger than just me. Um, you know, you go back to the Vaughan brothers, the brothers are, are long gone, but the company uh, exists far beyond that. And that's because they planned and they built a company and a collection of, of views and the way of doing things that transcends their lifetime. And I think that that's what we're trying to do here. We're, we're hopeful that we're just in the early stages of something that multi generations can uh, can carry on into the future and, and see the trends and adjust accordingly. But just provide that opportunity um, for others to do some amazing things and and try to pass along those values that got us to where we are today. So you've come a long way, and um, you had an impressive. Uh, exhibit at the International Mass Timber Conference. I I, I got to say I liked yours the best. It was Brady. You, you, it was incredible. It was this big two story CLT type. I mean, how would you describe it, Russ? Your your exhibit. It, it was like kind of half of a custom mountain home. <laughs> it was super cool. And um, but I guess the point of the story is this is now. Um, you know, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag by any means, but more on like a two, three, four, five year scale. I know you're not sitting on your hands. I mean, do you got, do you got any big plans that you can kind of share? Like, you know, what would be next in your world? If Yeah, if absolutely. We I mean, we're committed to growing our business. I mean, we built this one, this plant to kind of be the proof of concept to learn so we could scale and go where we think this market is going and where this industry is going and really build a strong foundation and a reputation. So when we start to expand beyond what we're doing now, people are like, want to do business with us and say, Hey, did, you know, are you able to, to take our project and make this work? That's kind of the approach that we want to create. Um, and, so with that, we've got plans in the works for a brand new press line that will complement what we're doing here. Um, that'll take our glue lamb and our four foot CLT and our GLT, and uh, we'll add um, primarily CLT um, that will allow us to go from eight feet wide up to 12 feet wide and likely go up to 60 feet in length. We're still kind of getting the finalized uh, length characteristic on that. We do a little bit of 60 foot with our current plant, um, but there might be some reasons and opportunity that we would uh, we would go a little bit shorter than that from a handling and transportation standpoint. But and that then allows us to build really a fully integrated facility that allows us to build any mass timber building that can be conceived. 
Is we that expanded in Colville? Yes. Cool. Yeah. So we're going to do that here, but the, uh, the, the plan is to make that scalable. So we're looking at other locations. We've done a lot of investigations in the, you know, the Intermountain West, the Lake States, the South. Um, there are lots of opportunities for us to potentially grow. And uh, so what we're doing here, it's, you know, we want to be able to build something to where when you walk in to a Vaughan Timbers facility, wherever it is, it looks very much the same as something that you've seen in one of our other locations. And that is so we can build continuity of production. We can build continuity of training um, and, and people know what they can count on from us. And then we can also know what the output will be so we can help the schedule because the schedule and building and construction is critical. So making the manufacturing align with what the clients need and want is going to be really important. Exciting yeah, times, exciting. man. Well, to get into the some of the last questions to wrap it up, we always like to ask, that, hey, what's a, a favorite book of yours? Could be earlier in your years, could be now, maybe a book, a podcast, a show, documentary, something that kind of stands out and um, changed you. Well, I think that uh, I've been enjoying uh, Patrick Bet David and Valuetainment a lot lately. I think love that show. The, the people that he's having on there are the real like influencers, um, you know, across political lines, across industries. And then to that end, uh, you know, I, I've, I've read a lot of great books. I'm listening to one that I, um, actually I, I'd heard about, but never really got tied into it's the, the blue ocean strategy. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, actually it was Patrick Bet David that had mentioned that that is probably the greatest marketing book out there. And so, uh, that is one that I've been just absorbing recently. And I also consume a great amount of, uh, Grant Cardone's, uh, content. Um, I've read his books, his 10 X thinking is on the mark. Um, and you know, I think I've done what he says, you know, in terms of, of taking big action, but I didn't really understand it until I really started listening to what he's doing and his approach. And we've actually used him in sales training for our team and other things like that. But just that oh, cool. whole mindset of taking big, massive action. I think a lot of people think too much and it keeps them from actually getting out there and creating action. And it reminds me of something that I heard a long, long time ago. I think it was actually Kenneth McFarlane, who was like a motivational speaker in the 40s and 50s. And I was fortunate enough to run into a bunch of his old audio tapes back in the day when I was driving around. And, um, you know, he, he just uh, he says some things that are, are really it's amazing to hear somebody talk that long ago. And it's still the same principles of what what are successful today and one of the things that he talked about that was so like while i was driving was that you know if you were to think about a road trip across the country and you were to really sit down and think about all the dangerous things that could happen you know rock sliding off the hill as you're driving by or bad weather and icy roads other drivers you know potentially running into you or running a red light all these things that could happen, you would never leave right? right? because it would it would paralyze you. But once you get going, you realize it's not like that. You know, you're you're equipped to handle what's in front of you, even when and we've all been in like close calls and, you know, seen, you know, bad drivers do different things. But if you're if you're out there enough, you realize you can probably handle just about anything. There's bad accidents, but that's, you know, that's the same thing like staying inside because you're afraid lightning's going to strike you. It's, right. it's likely not going to happen and you can take method, uh, take measures to reduce those risks. It's the same with any action. If you let everything that you can think about keep you from doing it, you'll never get there. So it doesn't, you don't need to think anymore on it. You need to act on it. And I think that massive action is one of the key things that, ties all successful organizations and people together. You've got to act, you've got to move ahead. And if you do that, 
you will figure out how to become successful. Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, one of our last two questions, uh, who inspires you in your industry? Boy. Well, I mean, the, the cop out easy answer is my team here, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, that's not necessarily fair. I would say that, um, uh, there's a couple of people that have influenced me in, in the industry here. Um, I would, I'd have to say my father, like we don't always get along, but he's like, there's a reason that he was the first ever timber processing man of the year. There's a reason that he's navigated a company through black swan events and come out the other side being more successful. And it's just like, you know, massive perseverance. I would also say I've got a great friend that I've developed who's now the managing director of uh, Hussaw in Finland, Marco Rautio. And, uh, and just learning from somebody from a different part of the world that, you know, how business works, what, what, what's common among all businesses. Um, and, you know, I had the great fortune of uh, having his son, Pavo come here last year for uh, an internship or a practicum for his engineering degree. So he got to come to North America, spend uh, the better part of three months learning how a, a North American CLT plant works and, and then go back to Finland and apply that. Maybe someday he'll get uh, his degree and want to come back here and, and help us figure out how to do things better. But those are the, those are the people that I interact with. I mean, there's a ton of people, great people in this industry, you know, Craig Rawlings and Arnie Didier, those guys are, you know, totally different realm of the world. You know, they, they, they approached this thing from a different place and have created a niche that nobody even thought existed before. So, you know, different ways of thinking. And then they all share in that just steadfast, you know, keep moving ahead, take action and make something happen. For cool. Sure. For sure. Well, before we get into our magic genie question, where can people find you out there and get in contact? Let's say I want to develop and stuff. I mean, who, how do we get in contact with you? Well, I think first you go to our website, just look at what we've got there from a project's perspective. Um, we've got a, a general info at um, bogandtimbers.com. My email address is rboggin at bogandtimbers.com. And I can you know direct you to our sales team. Um, you can get our phone number. Uh, from the website as well. And then we're on all the social media platforms and uh, I'm pretty active on there and we're constantly moving things around. Uh, but uh, yeah, if there's something you have a question on, um, reach out to us, either email or call and, and we'd be happy to work you through it if it's a project or you just had a question about the way we do things. Great. All right, last question. It's a little bit of a fun one. Uh, let's say you found a magic genie, but it can only grant one wish specific to your industry. What would you wish for and why? Well, I, I'm going to make it happen without the magic genie, but I think <laughs> if I could make it happen, um, it would be like, a one, it would be, um, getting the, the actual credit for what we're doing out in the forest. And that's a multifaceted thing. But what I mean by that is you know, getting the credit from a carbon credit standpoint. I mean, this should be definitely part of that whole discussion, but also credit for doing the right thing and allowing us to move at scale on our federal forest lands um, to reenter some of these places that have been missing infrastructure for decades and decades. So they actually can afford to do the thinning that's out there. And I think that's, uh, even though, you know, we have a profitable business that we're trying to run and we would like to make money so we can reinvest and do new things. I still think that's a pretty altruistic um, outcome because you're going to build economics in communities that otherwise wouldn't have it. You're going to be able to create a healthier forest, which is a healthier environment for everybody. And we're going to create healthy, beautiful, big buildings um, that are, you know, offset by the um, carbon that they hold within themselves. So I, I think that that is probably the longest one answer that you can get from a genie in a bottle, but it's really just like 
recognizing the great work that is being done on the section of forest that we should be managing. And I would just say lastly that I would also say that there's really good reason for us to have protected areas. There's good reason for us to have parks and wilderness. We don't need to manage every acre, but those acres at the front country that already have roads that we're recreating in and that we're near communities, let's just manage those. If we just manage those, we can build a wonderful industry and we can have healthy forests, healthy water, and healthy air. I love it. Well, this is huge. This is an educational lesson. And that's what we're trying to do at Mass Timber Group is network, advocate, and just educate and build in Mass Timber. And we um, thank you very much for having uh, some time with us. And hey, we'll see you around. I'm sure, Russ. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care. Thanks.